Good evening. I think we're all set. I have my computer, you have the slides, the microphone is working. What can go wrong? <laughs> what I'd like to do to talk about tonight is um, I have a few things I'd like to say. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about alcohol. Uh, I'd like to talk about a little bit about depression. Uh, and I'd like to present you some of the research that we've been conducting here. I'm going to apologize if some of you have heard me speak before because you will probably find a certain amount of this a bit repetitious because I, I, I tend to, 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 um, to, to repeat myself. Um, but uh, I'd be very happy to take questions at any stage, but preferably at the end. But if you, if you feel the urge and there's something that has to be said, go, go right ahead. I can, I, can, I can handle the flow. But I'll be, um, I, I hope to speak for about 30, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then maybe take about 15 minutes of questions, something along those lines. Um, I'd like to present a little bit about uh, alcohol first. And alcohol, as you know, has been with us for a while. Um, it wasn't the Irish who invented alcohol. Uh, Euripides, a Greek in 400 BC, which is a while ago now, uh, talked about Bacchus uh, discovering the juice of the grape and introducing it to mankind, stilling thereby each grief that mortals suffer from. Well, that was an interesting view, and that was held 2,500 years ago. I'm not quite sure I'd agree with that, uh, but this is a, a painting by uh, the Spanish painter Velázquez about the wonders of Bacchus discovering the, uh, the grape and the, and the, and the joys of, of drinking. Um, however, uh, in more recent times, we've discovered that there are some negative aspects of alcohol, and this is just some of the list of hundreds of famous people who have developed addiction problems. Amy Winehouse tragically died about a year and a half ago um, at the age of 27 with a, a severe alcohol problem. Beethoven um, was actually a well-known heavy drinker. Um, I don't think it contributed to his deafness. I don't know if it contributed to his Ninth Symphony, but I think it contributed to his relatively early demise. Um, but so he was, he, I, I, I don't think the term alcoholic was invented around the time of his life, but he certainly was a very heavy drinker. Billy Joel uh, is a reformed alcoholic and uh, was drinking during an awful lot of his musical career. That uh, next picture is of, um, anybody uh, uh, identify who that? It is, it is actually Britney Spears, and that's during her one of her less uh, uh, productive periods um, and when she was caught intoxicated. That's Buzz Aldrin, who was number two on the moon. And Buzz Aldrin uh, was, was uh, an alcoholic and uh, has talked about his, his, his entering into recovery. Uh, it is said that he was actually the first choice to, to, uh, to, to be the first man on the moon. Uh, but uh, the rather dour and less charismatic um, uh, number one uh, candidate was switched at the last moment. So actually, and, and it is thought that it, partly it was recognized that Buzz had a bit more uh, Yahoo, a little more jazz about him, uh, and that it was, it was thought that Neil Armstrong was a more stable, more uh, calm character, and being the son of an accountant, uh, he, he, he kept that rather dour philosophy. Uh, and, but uh, Buzz Aldrin turned out to be number two, and he, he was uh, he's, uh, as a reformed alcoholic. Charlie Sheen has had multiple uh, episodes of uh, public in intoxication and troubles, um, and I don't think he is in recovery. He is evidence of the genetic nature. His, his dad, Charlie Sheen, was also uh, an alcoholic and is, is in recovery. Um, Robert Downey Jr. has had um, very public battles with uh, addiction with alcohol and with heroin and had a, a 10, 15 year saga of, of addictive uh, disorder, but he's currently thriving and doing very well in recovery. And then our own George Best um, uh, had a long and troubled uh, battle with alcohol, uh, received a liver transplant, was, did absolutely wonderfully for a year after his liver transplant and then on the first anniversary of his liver transplant, he decided to celebrate uh, his, uh, his, his successful recovery for a year in the liver transplant, started drinking again, and was dead within six months. Um, but they're just a random sample I could go on. There are hundreds of, of, of examples of, of famous alcoholics uh, basically demonstrating the point they're everywhere. It's not them, it's, it's us. Uh, the, 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 it's, it's so common. The Irish artist Michael Farrell um, uh, was uh, also an extremely heavy drinker and an alcoholic. He died about 12 years ago. And uh, he, uh, 
this is one of his uh, drawings or his paintings, and this is obviously uh, on the theme of, of uh, drinking and, and glass, and, and that's a self-portrait of him uh, in relation to, to alcohol. In terms of depression, again, the list of, of celebrity uh, who, who have had depressive disorders or variations of is extraordinarily common. Um, uh, Sinead O'Connor has had public battles with mood disorders. Elton John has gone public about his, his problems with uh, depression and also uh, with, with addiction. Uh, Robbie Williams has also had severe bouts of, of, of depression and gone public about them. Stephen Fry has battled depression and bipolar disorder. Winston Churchill uh, famously talked about his black dog. And, uh, and then Hugh Laurie, uh, Stephen Fry's uh, previous comedy partner, has also publicly talked a lot about his, his battles with depression. And again, the, 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 the list goes on and on, and this is only a, a small selection of those who have gone public about it. Again, this is an extraordinarily common problem. The uh, famous uh, artist Jack Yates um, also suffered severely from depression. And... Uh, this is uh, one of his later paintings in, in which there's a, a very uh, morbid and uh, uh, clearly depressive theme uh, on evidence. And uh, it had a massive influence upon his, his painting and his artistry. And uh, he battled depression uh, 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 until, until, until his death. Um, alcohol is the most troublesome drug that is known to man. Uh, and this is, a, I, I'm producing a slide here from research produced by David Knott, who is the leading uh, pharmacologist in, in the UK concerning with drugs and alcohol. And this is a, an expert uh, analysis of uh, the comparison between um, all other drugs of abuse and, and alcohol in terms of harm to self and harm to others. And that while other drugs such as heroin and cocaine may cause uh, a significant potential harm to the, 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 uh, the, the user. It's only alcohol that has the, an equally high potency of causing destruction to the user and destruction to those around them. So alcohol has that unique characteristic of a, as, a, as a potential substance of abuse of being uh, the most harmful substance uh, known to man. In Ireland, we drink a lot. Uh, we are still the fourth highest in the EU, about 11 litres. It's gone down to about, uh, about 10 recently. Uh, we are the highest binge drinkers in Europe, about 34%, much higher than the, the EU average. Um, we had a massive increase in consumption during the Celtic Tiger years, up to 2005, and it's tapered off a little bit since then. We're still very high, but we're not quite as high as we were in 2005. Uh, the, the, this has produced a massive increase in alcohol-related deaths, where in that same 10-year period, uh, up to 2005, there was a 100% increase in alcoholic liver disease by increase by 150%, uh, and a 90% increase in alcohol-related injuries over that same 10-year period. So not only have we had an increase in alcohol consumption, but we've had an increase in the consequences of that. And basically it says that alcohol consumption and our relationship with alcohol is, is decidedly harmful. What happens if we become problem drinkers and we do nothing about it. The prognosis is not good. 40% of people who develop problems or an addiction to alcohol drink themselves to death. 35% uh, go in and out of drink problems over the lifetime and 20% stop spontaneously. Alcohol dependence takes 10 years approximately of an individual's lifespan. It is slightly less harmful than smoking. Uh, but just slightly less. So uh, it is up there and it is a, a massive negative health consequence. I'm going to give you a definition of how we define a problem with alcohol. Um, in about a month's time, the terminology is going to change from alcohol dependence to a thing called alcohol use disorder. So I thought rather than go with the past, we'll go with the, the, the terminology that is developing. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background of that. When the term alcohol dependence was de developed, it was developed to, to convey the problem that it's not just an alcoholic, it's not just an all or nothing, it's a syndrome, it's a cluster of different characteristics. And uh, there was a, a definition of alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence, and then over the years it's become clear that really alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence are the same thing. So uh, the experts in the US have decided to amalgamate the two and call it alcohol use disorder. And the definitions of how you look at a problem with alcohol or alcohol use disorder are really done by all sorts of different 
characteristics. And it's according to 11 major headings. The first, that alcohol is an important or a central or takes a lot of time in an individual's life. Uh, that alcohol has major role harm in that person's life, perhaps in their role as a, a parent or as a spouse or, or as a breadwinner. Um, important social recreational activities are given up because of alcohol uh, that the individual stopped and started consumption in the past, cut down for a while, gone back on it. Um, there's a, an effort at cutting down on a, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, the individual generally drinks more than they want to when they have a drink, so there's a momentum behind drinking. Difficult to stop when they get going. Um, they keep on drinking despite awareness of recurrent problems, so persistence despite harm. And the individual drinks in hazardous situations, classically drink driving. Um, there may be significant craving, so a strong urge to drink at times. And then there may be signs of physical addiction to alcohol, which a lot of people believe are the only signs of, of a problem with alcohol. Withdrawal symptom signs, anxiety, shakes, sweats, nausea, or agitation and stopping alcohol. And there may be an increased tolerance to alcohol over the years. It takes more to get me drunk than it did than 10 years ago. Now, the interesting thing, I've given you 11 headings. In order to make a criteria of alcohol use disorder, you just need two. Okay? Not all 11. Okay? And then in order to, to be considered severe alcohol use disorder, four. Okay? So this is not an issue in which it is, uh, oh, you have to have everything. You have to have lost house, wife, family, kids, and job in order to have defined as a, as a problem. And that's a critical issue because very often when someone is looking at themselves, they say, oh, I may have issues, but you know, I'm not as bad as X over there because... They've lost their job, they've lost their house, they've lost their wife, and so on. So I know I may have issues, but I'm not as bad as X. Um, but that's not the defining characteristic. Uh, it, is, it is any, essentially, two of the above headings. And that's an important point. The other point, important point is not quantity-driven. It's not that I have two pints a night, I don't have a problem, you have three, you do. Um, this is not. It's a relationship issue. This is how this, this, this substance affects my life. Um, and that is the, the most important criteria about ro looking at the line in the sand. Is there a problem? Is there not a problem? What I'm going to be talking about in this presentation is one aspect of dual diagnosis. But when you look at it, dual diagnosis is a massive topic. Uh, we can look at other substance abuse, alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, LSD, ecstasy, opiates. So there's a whole series of, of potential substance abuse and then in terms of the range of psychological or psychiatric issues, there can be psychotic problems, bipolar problems, depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, cognitive concentration problems or personality disorders. And really, this presentation is only going to focus on one of the interactions between psychology, psychiatry, and substances of abuse. But you can see that this is a highly complex matrix. And so uh, while there's variations of a theme in each of these uh, addictive disorders in relation to each of the psychiatric ones, clearly it's a massively complex area. And of necessity tonight, I'm only going to really be talking about one of those areas. So let's look at the interaction between mood and drink. Okay. About 6% of the population suffers from alcohol dependence, to use the other terminology, and then by 6 and 7, so it's about 10, 12% suffer from, from alcohol use issues at any one time. Um, and then a further 8% would be in the, the, the issue of heavy consumption, but not quite problematic. About 8% of the population currently suffer from a depressive disorder and 1% to 2% from a bipolar. So about 4% of the population, 2 to 4%, suffer from both an alcohol and a mood problem when you take it at, uh, at, a, at an epidemiological level. Um, this is backed up by research. Um, and it is, is, th these are two studies they're going to present, not because I want to give you the detail, but just to show that there's two major studies and one, uh, a large study done in the US with a lifetime incidence of alcohol dependence that was 12% and increased depressive disorder on an, uh, about two to one. If you had an alcohol problem, you're twice as likely to have a depressive problem than if you didn't have an alcohol problem. And secondly, a study of a couple of thousand uh, 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 people with alcohol problem, alcohol dependent subjects in a genetic study called the COGA study. It was also done in the States. 
And I'm going to bring it down to the second last, uh, or the third last point, uh, the lifetime rates of independent mood disorder is raised uh, uh, mildly. Um, and it, in bipolar situation, it was uh, considerably higher. And this was also reflected in close relatives, suggesting that there's a genetic component uh, to this. Uh, these, these findings only give an example, replicated very frequently around basically alcohol and depression go together, I won't say hand in glove, but say hand in, in D-finger glove, or just uh, there's an association there. What are the mood effects of alcohol? The initial mood effects are fairly straightforward. Intoxication, we've all had the experience, uh, a generally a pleasant alteration of mood and often a, a diminution in anxiety symptoms. Depression caused by alcohol can be caused, can arise hours later, it can cause the next day, or it can occur a few days later. You can get drunk on Friday and get depressed on Tuesday. Okay? Uh, there can be that delay, and the reason I know it is because enough people have told me over the years, and while initially I wouldn't have believed that, um, I've heard it so often I now believe it, is that it's, it's not just that evening or the next morning where you might say there's an immediate effect, but there can be a delayed effect in which alcohol consumption or heavy alcohol consumption produces a mood effect a number of days later. For some alcoholics, it takes a certain amount of alcohol depressed. Two pints, fine, four pints, get depressed. Okay? For some, they only get depressed on one occasion out of one out of five or ten or twenty. So that you can go drinking three out weekends out of four in a month and they're fine, and then on the fourth weekend, suddenly the mood goes down. Okay? So there is that variable interaction, the variable response. And it can be significantly dependent on the overall mood before drinking. You go out and you're in good form, don't get depressed, you're mildly depressed, you go drinking, and then that mild depression is magnified tremendously by the alcohol. Okay? Um, so it is an enormous variation, both within the individual, in relation to quantity, and, and a time uh, in which the, the mood affects of alcohol, but they are very, very common. Alcohol can bring on suicidal ideas. Okay? It can make suicidal ideas more intense. And most distressing of all, it can make someone disinhibited enough to try out suicidal uh, activity, which they wouldn't do when sober. So when we think of being drunk and disinhibited, you think of you know, shouting and running up and down the middle of a uh, high street or, or whatever and making noise. And that's what most people, a lot of people do when intoxicated. Um, but if you're depressed and disinhibited, and you're suicidal and disinhibited, you can act on a suicidal idea that you wouldn't do when sober. Uh, and that is uh, an extremely distressing uh, uh, factor. Um, when someone comes in here uh, with an alcohol problem, 40% have major depression, 50% have anxiety, and about 15% have symptoms of elation or, or mania. Yeah. After four weeks of sobriety, the incidence of depression goes down from 40% down to 10%. The incidence of anxiety goes down from 50 to 15%. And the elation, the mania, goes down from 15 to 5%. So clearly, abstinence, a number of weeks of abstinence, often a number of days, but a number of weeks of absence, can have a massive positive mood beneficial effect. Um, Theoretically, you wait four weeks to be absolutely sure, but generally after a week, ten days, you can really sure be, be get an idea if an alcohol mood issue is, 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 is essentially, I won't say cured, but, but gotten rid of through, through, through sheer abstinence. Um, so, this is really important. 25% of suicides in this country are solely attributable to alcohol. Alcohol is present in 58% of completed suicides, the international norm is 38%. So in Ireland, we have a, a really particular problem with alcohol and suicide. If you commit suicide and you're under 30 in this country, you're 93% have alcohol on board when they actually uh, take their own lives. Um, so um, this is uh, a worldwide phenomenon that's particularly strong in Ireland and it's particularly strong in young people in Ireland. And alcohol is present in 41% of, of, of deliberate self-harm. That means suicidal gesture, but not actual uh, completed episodes. And I produced this graph from statistics between 1970 and 2000 about the rise in an, an alcohol consumption and the rise in the suicide rate. 
And it, you don't have to be a statistical genius to see that there is a connection there. There's a very strong correlation, and uh, this goes as far as 2005. Since 2005, the alcohol consumption in the country has tapered off slightly, uh, and the alcohol, but the, the suicide rate has indeed gone up. So what has happened, particularly in the last four years, is that the suicide rate has gone up because of the economic situation and the recession and that effect, and, and not because of, 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 of alcohol. So I, I'm certainly not turning around and saying it's all due to alcohol. But there is a massive connection between the two, uh, particularly as, as the rise in alcohol consumption o o until about 2005. Sobering thoughts. I'm not going to go through all the factors about depression because that would take many hours, days, weeks. So I'm just going to pick a few factors that I think are of interest, that I think are of importance, that you may not be aware. There is a risk for depression, and I want to just explore that. Family history. Uh, depression of, as a disorder is about 40% genetic, okay? which uh, means that a large number of people who get episodes of significant clinical depression do have a family history. Alcohol is about 50% genetic, uh, but, but uh, depression uh, is about 40% genetic. Women get depression more often than men do, um, and uh, that's, it's a ratio of about 2 to 1. Uh, traumatic life events, particularly recent life events, if you've had a particularly stressful or traumatic life event in the previous six months, you are more likely to get depressed than if you haven't. Uh, childbirth is a, a major uh, cause of, of depression and uh, postnatal depression has uh, been frequently talked about and, and wonderfully talked about by, by, by some celebrities, um, but it is a, around 10% uh, go get episodes, not just of baby blues, which is about 40-50%, but about 10% get full episode of, of, of depression uh, post-childbirth. Um, early childhood neglect or abuse or loss. If you lose a parent before the age of 11, if you suffer trauma, suffered any sort of abuse, physical, neglectful, sexual, uh, all this severe childhood trauma lends the, 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 it increases the, the risk of, of later uh, onset of depression. Personality traits, some people who, who are on the bit more on the obsessive, neat, uh, punctual, uh, uh, rigid side tend to, to get episodes of depression rather than those who are on the more casual, uh, relaxed, um, uh, the, I won't say sloppy side, because I, but certainly the more relaxed style. And then again, that makes intuitive sense. Personal isolation. Human interaction tends to diminish episodes of depression. Isolation tends to increase it. Um, so that's a, 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 an association. Alcohol and substance abuse. And physical disorders, flu, thyroid disorder, cancer, loads of different uh, uh, stroke, uh, heart attacks, lots of physical illnesses are associated with the onset of depression later. When someone is drinking uh, to achieve sobriety, they can also get depressed after having achieved sobriety, which is a tremendous distress if you put all the effort into recovery, you've achieved a, uh, a degree of sobriety, you're engaging in recovery, and then your reward is you get about a depression. Um, and, and that seems like a terrible reward, but that can occur. Uh, alcohol withdrawal can produce anxiety symptoms. Craving for alcohol can present as depression. Uh, some people can miss alcohol, and they miss it, and it can, it can be a, a form of, of a craving, and it can present as depression. Um, coping with the effects of a long period of drinking. When people are drinking, they are often neglectful of financial matters, relationship matters, work problems, and often uh, in er early recovery, in early sobriety, all these financial and work and relationship issues come home to roost and have to be dealt with. So uh, that can produce a significant degree uh, of, of depression. And indeed, when someone is drinking, Really, maturity, people aren't maturing, developing coping skills when they're drinking. Um, so unfortunately, if someone's been drinking for many years, they really are dealing with coping skills that are 5 or 10 or 15 years out of date. Um, so often there's a, a degree of maturity required, which is, is suddenly uh, thrust on someone in early recovery, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a big learning curve. I'm going to talk a little bit about the treatments of, of, of depression. Um, and, uh, because I, I think it's important to be aware about the breadth of this. 
Okay. This is not uh, the most uh, familiar treatments that you'll hear talking about uh, by, by, by doctors and psychiatrists will often be medications such as antidepressants and mood stabilizers which can be used for uh, bipolar disorder also can be used in, in instances as a booster for antidepressants and rarely can be used on their own for treatment of, of, of pure depression but mood stabilizers are increasingly being used as boosters or as, as, as for depression as well. Uh, psychotherapy is, is, is a wonderful way of, of helping with depression. It can be any one of a variety of different types of therapy. I mentioned cognitive therapy, interpersonal therapy, even psychoanalysis. Um, the whole range of psychotherapies can be wonderfully helpful. Not for everybody, not in all situations. So there, uh, there, there are articles uh, which also detail there can be negative aspects of psychotherapy at uh, um, but uh, by and large, psychotherapy, talk therapy, getting it out of the system can be wonderfully helpful in terms of, of taking the edge off depression. Self-help. Um, books, I'm going to talk about my own book in a, just a minute. Groups such as this one, Aware, Grow, Recovery. Um, fabulous forums, educational forums, supportive forums, and uh, that, that, that can be wonderfully helpful in terms of, of, of coping with depression. Exercise. Research is being done a lot about exercise and depression and mood disorders. And what seems to be clear is that robust cardiovascular exercise can be very helpful. Not gentle exercise, not walking the chihuahua for 10 minutes, but actually cardiovascular exercise, it means getting out there, jogging, running, cycling, gym, that level of exercise. Uh, one very well done research uh, talked about 45 minutes three times a week of sweat-inducing exercise can actually be very helpful in moderate anxiety, moderate depression, maybe not quite as helpful in the severe side, but certainly in the, the, the mild and moderate levels can be really, really helpful. Relaxation. We hear an awful lot, or read an awful lot about mindfulness. Mindfulness, meditation, yoga, tai chi, <coughs> deep relaxation can be wonderfully helpful, particularly for anxiety, but also for depression. And so uh, I w I would, uh, it's important when looking at depression is looking at the breadth and not just the single, oh, we doubled the medication. It's a whole breadth of treatments that should be looked at in terms of treatment. And I mentioned ECT for severe depression, resistant depression, or a very, very uh, even life-threatening depression. It's important that is a highly successful treatment which can be used um, and is indeed remarkably successful. I wrote a book which I published about uh, two months ago called The U-Turn, A Guide to Happiness. And this book um, is based on somewhat of a cognitive model about looking at the factors that contribute to, to various negative emotions, um, including depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. and looking at factors that, that, that an individual can, can look at in order to try and help themselves deal with it. Um, it's, it's under a number of headings, uh, exploring the concept of self-understanding, which isn't always uh, dealt with in, 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 in all forums, looking at negative emotions, how they hurt us, anger, jealousy, depression, looking at the experience and how to escape the experience, looking at fear and, and interpersonal criticism, looking at probably the, one of the most important things, self-belief and the feelings of inferiority. Uh, Self-esteem is a really important concept and uh, most people who have gone through an episode of depression would, 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 would recognize that, how it can be a very self-attacking uh, series of thoughts. Um, so uh, exploring that and looking at the fundamentals of self-belief and changing around uh, a personal self-image is, is really important in terms of long-term getting rid of uh, negative uh, emotions. Uh, looking at the concepts of personality and how to project a personality in interpersonal uh, relationships, and the importance of talking, communication, getting things out of the system. Then a little bit of the importance in relationships, and then at the end of all, looking at the, the, the purpose is that uh, the, the, there's no point in going through a, a tremendously negative experience without turning around and saying, well, what use is it for? Where, where can I go with this? How can I turn this around? So looking at how to explore a joy and di discovering a purpose in life. Um, as part of writing it, I had to come up with that slightly weird concept, of what's the concept of happiness? How, how do you define happiness? Is it just 
an absence of depression, an absence of anxiety, an absence of unhappiness? I don't think so. Um, and I believe that happiness is a roundedly content and a very coherent, unified, uh, positive mental state. It's not an ignorant, superficial cheerfulness. It's not the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. It's not glib self-insurance and an ignorant wing. It's a knowing contentedness. And I believe that is a, it's, it's a lot more than just an absence of depression. Uh, so part of my reason in, in writing the book was to look at the idea of saying, this is worthy of attainment. There's absolutely no reason uh, why we can't uh, attain that. And there's absolutely no reason that we can't go on a journey to happiness. Part of what I also have done here has been looking at uh, the, the, the treatment of alcohol and the treatment of depression together. And 10 years ago, I, I developed the dual diagnosis program here. Um, and it's a, it's a broad program. Uh, it looks at lectures, looking at uh, both general issues and specific issues, video sessions specific for the program, individual therapy sessions, Alcohol Anonymous, uh, dual recovery groups, uh, life ring support groups, uh, and then group treatments, various headings that are to take part as part of the program. Uh, there's an initial part of the program, which is an assessment and detoxification, uh, a full program which can last up to four weeks, and then an aftercare of up to a number of months, up to six months uh, post-discharge. It was developed with eight principles in mind. It's developed saying, well, how do we take those principles? How do we put them into practice? The importance of follow-up. And I'm going to present some of the research that looks at how important follow-up is. Essentially, the real program, the real therapy, the real treatment starts the day someone leaves rather than not just the, 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 what happens in the program. Uh, we emphasize the interrelationship of the diagnosis, which is, follows on from what I was saying earlier, is that there is such a connection between alcohol and depression and when they're both are present, you really can't improve in one without improving in the other. Both have to be tackled. We, the, the particular therapeutic modality, relapse prevention, is the particular addiction therapy modality that we emphasize. We emphasize education, lectures, videos, and discussions. We also emphasize the stabilization of withdrawal and mood. So if medication is required, detoxification medication, antidepressant medication, mood stabilizing medication, we use it. Okay? Uh, we talk about the individuality of the program. Not, there, nobody is, is, is on, on the program is in, in exactly the same circumstance. So we adopt the program to the individual while still uh, uh, completing the program. We emphasize both uh, equivalently, and we talk about empowerment, individual responsibility. It's someone's journey. It's not the, the, the doctor's or, or the therapist's journey. Um, the research program we conducted, we started about seven years ago, eight years ago. Uh, we did a baseline series in, uh, of, of assessments. We did uh, a whole series of uh, depression, anxiety, elation, and, and, and craving measurements. Uh, three months, six months, and two years post-discharge. Uh, although I'll be presenting some of the two-year factors, we're now doing a full analysis of our five-year five -year data, but I don't have, a, have it adequately uh, uh, re refined for presentation. Uh, we did blood tests. Um, and we did a, essentially followed the, the guts of 200 people, and we got uh, about 75% of them at, at two years out of the 25%. Um, some died, some refused to participate, some illness, and some were, were un, uncontactable. The program was essentially uh, divided between those with a depressive disorder and a bipolar disorder, all at alcohol dependence. They, they were average uh, around in the mid-40s, uh, 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 14 years of education, most were in for 30, 35, and on the bipolar side, a uh, slightly longer stay. Most had one or two ad admissions previously. A strong family history, both of alcohol problems and of, of psychiatric problems. And indeed, uh, a suicide attempt in the previous year at about 30%. So the, the, these people who, who had significant issues. Um, we, in terms of uh, analyzing it, we, we looked at age, gender, and diagnosis as being very important factors, and I'm not going to go through the, the numbers, but basically that we, we broke the, the, the group up into three age groups below 30, uh, 31 to 50 is being middle-aged, and much to my distress, my statistician said that those who are 50 were regarded as the elderly group. So um, having just <coughs> uh, recently, uh, recently uh, reached that, uh, I, was, I was very distressed to, to, but that's what my statistician insisted, so, so 50 is now elderly. Um, uh, and then we divide people according to depression and bipolar and then uh, according to gender. Um, what was clear is that people, by and large, did well. 
Uh, and they often did well initially at, base, at baseline that the depressive disorder measurement fell significantly and it was remained at that level in both the depressed and the bipolar group at two years. And indeed, I can let you know at five years that was the, the same findings for anxiety. This is an anxiety scale. It was high at, uh, at baseline, at discharge it was lower, and then at six months and in two years it was into the very low level. Uh, these are biological markers of alcohol consumption, and they fell at baseline in six months, um, but this is the bit most particularly strong blood measurement of alcohol consumption, and that fell at baseline at six months and had fallen by two years. And then the self-report of alcohol consumption, which is another scientific way of which we basically ask, how much did you actually drink recently? Very high at baseline, not surprisingly. Low at six months and one year and two years, considerably lower. So the number of drinking days that they had in the previous 30 or 90 days was much lower. And the number of drinks per drinking day also went down very significantly at six months and indeed as far as the two years. I'm going to give some figures. There's too many figures there, but I'm just going to uh, just translate some of that. In the, the depressed group, the number of drinking days at baseline was 40. The number at two years uh, of the drinking days in the previous 90 has gone down to five. Um, so um, uh, percentage completely abstinent was almost 60% in the depressive group and was 53% in the bipolar group. So basically a lot of people had done very well and, they, and if they were drinking, uh, the number of drinks they were consuming was much, much less. We tried to say, well, how do we find out a base and what predicts um, who's going to do well. Um, organized aftercare and discharge. Those that said, you know what, I'm going to go to the aftercare. Very significant predictor at three months um, that that was a very pr protective factor. Um, if you had a high anxiety on admission, that was a prediction of relapse. Those that were more anxious did worse. Um, and the audit score was a score of alcohol severity and that if you had a higher degree of alcohol severity in this particular scale, that was predictive. Other issues, family psychiatric history, depression score, uh, were not predictive. By six months, slight, uh, the, the, the same aftercare, organizing aftercare, was still statistically significant, but anxiety had faded, the, 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 the audit score, the alcohol predict was still predictive, uh, family psychiatric history kind of was predictive, and drug history, those who had a, a drug history essentially did worse. So there's a slightly different set of factors at six months. At two years, some other uh, differences emerged. Gender emerged. Um, by and large, women did better, uh, and not massively, but significantly, and so men were, were more non-absent than women at two years. Uh, once more, reflecting, obviously, that women are much more superior to men, and that's, that's, that's <laughs> something which we, we all have to acknowledge. Um, diagnosis that those who had a depressive disorder uh, were, were more likely to be non-absent, and those who had a bipolar disorder, a slight increase, slight relative increase, but a statistical relative increase relative to the depressive. Those who have a bipolar tended to drink just a little bit more. Age. Basically, those that were under 30 did badly. Okay? And that matches international literature, which says that young people have a tremendous difficulty in coming to terms with any addictive disorder. This is a, a dual population, but young people have a tremendous difficulty in, in, uh, in coming to terms with our, our numbers of young people. We're not massive relative to the middle-aged and the so-called elderly. Um, but you can see the massive difference between 86% non-abstinent and in the older group, 39% non-abstinent. So you can see there's a big difference there. Young people, the real issue there is young people have a, a difficulty in dealing with addictive disorders. And then aftercare attendance, those that attended aftercare um, tended to be, to be more non-abstinent uh, than, than those that didn't. In other words, aftercare was protective, okay, which was matched what we found at six months and at three months. Those who were earlier abstinent, those who were abstinent earlier, tended to do better than those who relapsed earlier. And that's, you might say, is a statement of the obvious, but it's important, is that if you're abstinent at three months, you're more likely to be abstinent later, and if you're abstinent at six months, you're, you're more likely to be abstinent at two years. So those that stayed well initially tended to stay well into, into the long term. So the conclusions we arrived at... Um, this is a large, complex, and undertreated area. Um, 
that this triple integration of inpatient and outpatient, medication and therapy, addiction and mental health disorders, um, this is a program that can be successful. Uh, that bipolar people, uh, people with a bipolar disorder and a depressed disorder can be treated very well together. Uh, baseline predictive factors such as low anxiety, low audit scores and good aftercare can predict good medium-term outcomes and then followed uh, at two years, female gender, older age, a depression rather than a bipolar di diagnosis and a good early abstinence all predicted positive two-year outcomes. So uh, uh, to two years ago, I published this book, Overcoming Alcohol Misuse, which details an awful lot of the, 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 uh, the, the, the treatments that are available for the, the treatment of alcohol problems um, and the various treatment approaches and uh, uh, an outline of different ways, uh, and some of which I've mentioned tonight about the, tr the treatment of alcohol disorders. And I was delighted to say that Miriam and Callum was the, launched it uh, for, for me, and I think it's a nice way that... that her picture is up there to, to finish this lecture because I think that's how else, how, how else can you finish a, a lecture in a nicer way. So thank you very much. <laughs>